from Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 207, recorded on June 29th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello, everybody. Uh, looking out the window, just to bring you up to date as to what is zooey out there, little puffy clouds, um, very much a Georgia O'Keefe afternoon. Um, temperatures, 80s, 85, humidity about 50%, but it's going to get worse on the weekend. It's going to go all the way up to 90 and that sort of thing, but... Uh, I guess the only person we can feel good about that we don't have to put up with is uh, Rich Condit uh, on Twiv. He lives in Austin, Texas, and he's got like 30 days in a row of 100 degrees or more. <laughs> so we're we're still okay, but it's going to get hotter. It's going to get hotter. Also joining us today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. And I usually don't mention the weather, other than I will say today there's no <laughs> wind on the bay. Zero. <laughs> That's too bad. Uh, for Claire's uh, ramification, uh, Daniel is a, an ace sailor and um, owns a beautiful boat. And someday he might even take us out on it. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us from Glasgow, Scotland, Christina Naula. Hello. Good evening. Nice to be here. I'm looking out of my window. It's still daylight, although it's nine o'clock. Um, no puffy clouds, just dark gray clouds, and it's been miserable. And um, as you can see, it's fleece weather, so I'm cold. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? Oh, interesting. <laughs> well, it's not, not freezing cold, here. but, you know, below 20 <laughs> degrees. So. Ha! Huh. <laughs> So our guest today is from Los Angeles, California, Claire Pinocean. Welcome to TWIP. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here. Oh, so you want to know about the weather? I'm in Pasadena. Yes. <laughs> Come on, yesterday, what's going on out there? Yesterday was 99. You know, we're supposed okay. to have a, a, a month that we call June gloom. And that means that June can be somewhat cloudy and even a little, you know, foggy near the ocean. But we're not having that kind of June. Today, it's more like 93. But it's very bright and sunny. So, Christina, come our way and warm up. <laughs> You're welcome I've just, to I've, Yeah, I've just translated Fahrenheit to Celsius. And, oh, gosh, is it nice. It's hot. <laughs> so, Claire, uh, I normally tell – you're in Los Angeles, is that correct? Well, yes, I'm a native of Los Angeles. I live in Pasadena. I work Pasadena. at UCLA, which is on the west side of Los Angeles. Okay, so you're you're from UCLA, and you're in what department at UCLA? Oh, I'm in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases. I've been a faculty member at UCLA for more than 35 years. Okay. Yeah. So uh, thank you for joining us, and and uh, looking forward to our conversation. I, I wonder if we could start by talking about your training. So before you're from LA, uh, where did you go to school? Okay. Well, I'm a third or fourth generation Californian. Both of my parents went to the University of California. Um, I went to Stanford. I majored in history, but of course I was pre-med because I am a physician. And I couldn't wait to leave California, which always shocks people. But <laughs> I guess my family wanted me to stay in the state. But at age 21, when I started medical school, I moved to Chicago. And I attended Northwestern for medical school. And I actually am a big fan of Chicago. Um, it's a great city. Yeah, it is a great city. And Northwestern, the medical school is in a particularly nice part of the city, which yeah, I enjoy. Exactly. Exactly. I went to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. I actually interrupted my third year of internal medicine residency to do that. Um, I was very big on doing tropical medicine and international health early on. I went to Haiti before I even started medical school, spent the summer right. there. And uh, after I completed my medicine residency, I moved to Boston and I did my infectious diseases and geographic medicine uh, fellowship uh, 
and postdoctoral training at Tufts New England Medical Center. And I loved Boston. So I was away from California for 12 years. And then I finally decided, yes, it was time to return to my home state. And I took my first UCLA position. Would you like me to tell you about that? Mm -hmm, Sure. It was, uh, you know, in the meantime, I had been traveling overseas and that'll come up later. But I, uh, I decided to take the position of chief and I would say chief and Indian of infectious diseases at the smallest of the four county hospitals in Los Angeles. I began that position in 1983. And um, that was a very seminal period for me because that was certainly in a very active era of HIV, uh, which time when I started that position, we had no real diagnostics. We couldn't test blood. We could only treat obvious end stage complications. But at that hospital, because I was the only infectious diseases physician, I did pediatric infectious diseases. I did adult infectious diseases. I chose all the antibiotics. I did the infection control. I interacted with the county health department around various diseases. And um, it was a seminal stage. And we had many, many patients who were foreign born, needless to say. I was there for about three or four years. And then I, I segued eventually back to the main UCLA campus um, where I accepted a position in 1987. And at that point, I was a clinical infectious diseases faculty member. Um, I was also the first person ever really to be a clinical travel and tropical medicine specialist. And I started those services at UCLA Uh, But I had already launched my second career in medical journalism, so I I divided my time in various ways. The great thing about UCLA, and I don't want to drone on and on, but because the medical school and the campus are close, I had a lot of interaction with faculty members who were not in the medical school. And I worked with economists, and I worked in, I eventually uh, did some work in global health policy, at the same time continuing to be you know, a clinician and a known person, especially in Los Angeles for tropical medicine, did overseas work, continued my journalism work in various ways. So very eclectic, nice combination. I'm very grateful, actually, that I was able to do all those things. Right. And do you continue your affiliation with UCLA today as well? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm a a professor. (laughs) I'm a professor emeritus recalled. (laughs) <laughs> and that is because they had a, I would, wouldn't call it a loophole, but in, because I was hired officially in the 80s, I was able to become emeritus at a relatively young age. And that gave me a little bit more freedom in terms of how I divvied up my time. And to be perfectly honest, what it meant was that I did not have to generate as much income through clinical activities, which I enjoyed, but which are very onerous. And if you're trying to pursue creative avenues as well, you know, one can hamper the other. So I remain uh, emeritus and recalled. I still have my office at UCLA, even though during the pandemic, I haven't spent all that much time there. I do teach. Actually, I teach on the main campus at UCLA, have done for several, well, I would say more than two decades so I teach undergrads, uh, and I have taught in some of the graduate schools. And so I just kind of follow my heart. What do you teach? Well, we have a, a major uh, called Interma- International Development Studies, where um, the students need to understand global health as part of development. As I said, because I've worked with a lot of economists, I, I got a kind of apprentice training in that area. Um, And I I teach some seminars that are actually geared towards the younger undergrads. They're called Fiat Lux seminars. And I can choose, you know, I like to teach them about infectious diseases. I like to, this fall, I'll be teaching them about foodborne parasites. Foodborne infection is a particular interest of mine. Um, Me too. (laughs) I love getting the response of the younger students, I mean, medical students are amazing. We know that, right? They'll learn anything. They just, you know, they just 
Just tell them it's going to be on the test. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> but because I've had a true second career in, in what you might call popular journalism, I, I really actually am very interested in what these bright young people know and don't know and what their misconceptions might be. And they come from a very diverse set of backgrounds because UCLA attracts a very diverse student body. So they bring cultural experiences, which are fascinating. So it's, it's really quite a pleasure to, to teach those younger undergrads. How did you meet Dixon? Wow. Oh, meeting Dixon. I've been <laughs> looking forward to sharing this story. So uh, as I said... I did attend the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in 1979. I am 71, by the way. No secret about my age. Um, and when I began my fellowship in Boston, I did a year of clinical infectious disease at Tufts. And then I moved into the geographic medicine area. Now, um, there's some important history, actually, here. The geographic medicine unit at Tufts was a fairly new thing. Um, there had been an initiative through the Rockefeller Foundation to support research in what they then called the great neglected diseases of mankind. And Ken Warren, who was a well-known researcher actually at Case Western and did work in Schisto, became the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Right. So initially, there were four universities that had this Rockefeller funding. Tufts, Harvard, Case Western, and the University of Virginia is what I recall. I think then it got spread in wider. Um, so I joined a unit. And by the way, the other interesting thing is that Sheldon Wolf, who had been the head of NIAID, had come to Tufts to become the chairman of medicine. So he was right. very influential. He brought incredible people from NIH. So I worked with, uh, Jerry Kirsch was the head of geographic medicine. This gets us to Dixon, finally. Dixon was visiting and um, I met Dixon in a lab. I was doing basic science research for several years on leishmaniasis. Uh, so Dixon and I met and because of my recent training in tropical medicine, I was kind of like the tropical medicine clinician, even though I was just a fellow. And I had just cared for a patient um, who later became a friend who had been a Peace Corps volunteer <laughs> and then taken another assignment with the State Department in West Africa. So he had been both in, um, I believe, Gabon, and he had been in what was then called Upper Volta, which today is Burkina Faso. And when he came back, his blood was screened and he had just a huge eosinophilia. And then they said, OK, you know, this is what this is the way a Peace Corps operated. OK, now you can have your infectious diseases consult. They'll pay for it. And he arrived at Tufts and um, he was a guy in his 20s. And he had a very heavy infection with a filarial parasite called Loa Loa. And. So everybody was more than happy for me to take over. <laughs> I, to. I had to arrange for, I see Daniel smiling, because I think he can picture this. We did, we did hospitalize him. We were nervous. You know, I had to get diethylcarbamazine, um, you know, and, and treat this very heavy uh, bloodborne parasite. Uh, and... He, of course, did okay in the hospital. We gave him some steroids. And then when he came home, he got very sick again, just naturally, you know, reacting to the uh, uh, effect on his, on his heavy loa loa infection. But what I had that interested Dixon, so I think I was talking to Dixon about this patient. And in loa loa, because the adult worms migrate through subcutaneous tissues, there is an inflammatory reaction that can be transient called a calabar swelling, and they can also right. get odd rashes. And so I had actually taken pictures of this. I think Dixon was preparing either his first or second textbook. I don't know which one, but as soon as he knew I had a photo, he was just brimming with enthusiasm. <laughs> I mean, he had this natural bonhomie. We had a natural, you know, <laughs> 
anyway. But the photo was gold, and I provided the patient was fine with this, didn't even show his face. He didn't have the form crossing his eye, which is another kind of textbook feature in some patients with LOA. So uh, that's how we met. It was good. It was very good. stayed Periodically. You stayed, you stayed in touch afterwards? You oh, know, yeah. I think it was just natural periodic uh, intersections, maybe, at the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, over the That's years. Right. And eventually became president of the society. Yes, right? I, I was elected president. I think Diane... That's not, a, that's not, a, uh, uh, that's not a trivial thing. I must tell you that I've known a lot of presidents of that society, and they've all been men. And um, forget the first woman who was the chair, who was the, uh, you weren't the first woman, I don't think. No, no, I was the fifth. Uh, Diane Worth or somebody like that was the first. And then I think I was on the nominating committee, and I remember I said, we haven't had a woman on this uh, as president. Here's how to do it. You nominate four women. Take your choice. (laughs) <laughs> and they did. And that's how a woman got elected to the president of ASTMNH. And I'm very um, honored and proud to know you, Claire, because oh. I think um, your contributions have spread beyond the classroom, obviously. They've gone out into the popular press. You haven't dumbed it down. You haven't um, catered to sensationalism. Uh, it's sensational enough to know that there's an eye crawl, a worm crawling across your eye. Um, you don't have to make these stories up. Everybody loves them to begin with. So, and you know that I was a science advisor to monsters inside me. Same yeah. deal. P, yeah. you don't have to. You don't have to exaggerate it for those to um, catch your attention. So, I, I deeply appreciate knowing you and all the things that you've oh. done for the society. And you also never didn't have a smile on your face. Oh. Well, the feeling is mutual, as you know, and I was very honored. In fact, I had to have my arm twisted to be the nominee. Um, I'm Tom sure. Monath, it's a lot of work. It's a lot Tom of work. Monath, who is, I think, probably known to you because he is a great virologist and many other things. Just, I had been on the council, and, he, and he, I, the first time he asked me, I said, oh, I don't think so. And he said, oh, come on, Claire. You know, it's like... <laughs> do this and and indeed i i could it was i just had not envisioned myself doing it but diane worth was the woman who there had been i i think i was the fifth woman but diane worth who's still a, a immense powerhouse in malaria yep. and a great Alicia Nias, that's medicine right. scientist she indeed. dubbed me the communications president so i do think that was one of that was probably my most notable qualification um, right? because we need science communications as witnessed by your podcast. <laughs> there you go. Oh, my, it's clear when I I started the first podcast this week in virology in, ni- in 2008 and Dixon was the first person who came to mind to do it with me because he loved to teach, he loved to talk and it was a perfect uh, start. And uh, this here we are uh, many years later, we have six, seven different <laughs> podcasts doing very well. So I have to thank Dixon for wanting to do and, that originally. D- did you imagine this or no. it just came to you as a, a brilliant idea and it just was meant to be? I started listening to podcasts and I thought this is a good way to talk about science. And I said, yeah. let's try it. But I didn't think it would get anywhere. I just you know, it was an experiment and I wanted to try it. But to my surprise, people listened. And to this day, many, many people. Been, and then COVID, of course, gave us a huge bump. Um, so now I'm in in a studio in New York City that we leased last year. And, and we could, uh, Daniel and I have leased this studio, our companies. And um, it's because of COVID that we were able to do this. So it's really exciting. May, um, I, exciting. may I give you some yeah. feedback? My yeah, husband, of course. Only if my it's husband positive, has had right? eight Emmys. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Go ahead, my go husband ahead. has had eight Emmys. He is a very creative, talented guy who started in the mailroom at CBS Television City in Los Angeles and has been a producer and director and a filmmaker. Um, and he has been watching recently uh, 
And <laughs> he loves, loves, loves your really? podcast. He loves the authenticity. He loves <laughs> just the, and he finds the science very intriguing. So I think, you know, you already do have a very significant following, but I thought you might appreciate that from That's a great. fellow I agree. communicator. I love yeah. to hear it. I love to hear it. I recently, a uh, someone else from LA who used to be in film, he used to work as light on lighting in film and he's been giving me advice on my lighting. So I really <laughs> appreciate it. I have multiple film people one in Montana, I think who you, who's, Oh, you have to change this. You have to change that. And I appreciate it. Cause I'm a scientist. I don't know anything. <laughs> well, but it works. Uh, it's working. I, I think that you said it, it, the authenticity, we are just, scientists talking and I yeah. think most people don't have the opportunity to hear that and so they like it right that's the key and but part of it I'm sorry to interrupt God go ahead I'm done I was just going to say that part of it that they like the most is the honesty when they say authenticity perhaps they mean honesty because I can't tell you how many times on that show particularly on TWIV uh, which is not in my subject area, but it is now, of course. Um, and on TWIP occasionally, but not too often, I will make a major mistake. I mean, a major mistake. Um, <laughs> you know, and I forget my first one, but it was pretty bad. And, and someone called in and said, that's not why they named that virus. They named it because of the, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. So I had to apologize to the public. And I, and I, I apologize very easily by saying, you know, when you when you're live and you're speaking, uh, you don't have the option for looking things up. So these are things you remember, and I had remembered it wrong, and I'm sorry about that, but it was wrong. I freely admit I was wrong. Now we it's all make rare mistakes. to find people in the in your business, which is in front of a lot of other people, to say they were wrong. Hmm. They love to say they were right, like oh, Rush I Limbaugh. So I think healthy. of all these big mouths. <laughs> They're all <laughs> egotists beyond belief. We so, don't have one of those in our shows, not one. No. No. So, Claire, let, let me ask you a little bit more about the ASTM and H because um, we're sure. we're big supporters of them. We always do like you know a uh, Parasites Without Borders fundraiser, and we're all going to head there in the fall. Hopefully, you're going to be there, and we'll all, like hang yes, out I together. So, and I actually, you know, one of my first connections with ASTM and H was driving down there with Dixon in the car, um, you know, True. enjoying, enjoy, <laughs> in his Prius, <laughs> enjoying his uh, stories. Um, and then I actually, um, I met, I don't know if you know Pat Walker. I actually met her in oh, Thailand sure. and yeah. Kim, and we're, we're in Cambodia. We're having lunch and I'm like, oh, Pat, I understand you some have some connection with the ASTM. Oh, I'm the incoming <laughs> president. I was like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> So I've always loved that organization, but I just would love like, you know, being a past president, um, you know, your, your perspective. It's a, it's a wonderful community. Um, I feel closer to ASTMNH than any other scholarly society. We don't need to mention the others, you know, them, uh, with no <laughs> disregard. No, no, that's not meant to be a sly poke. It's just that I joined I guess I probably joined the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene when I was in London in 1979. And then I joined ASTMNH in 1980 when I was uh, an infectious diseases fellow because everything about my infectious disease training was predicated on my interest in tropical medicine. I wasn't even sure I wanted to do an infectious diseases fellowship per se, but I realized that I liked infectious diseases. Let's face it. I mean, it's exciting medicine, and I've done a lot of it. I've done, you know, all the standard stuff. But um, so I have been a member for that long, and I've seen ASTMH grow, and I've seen it become uh, even more international. There's a tremendous push to uh, provide uh, support to members from low and middle income countries to bring science into you know to have a very global conversation around science to uh, encourage more student memberships uh, and so you know it's just a it's just a wonderfully inspiring organization um, and I have many friends of course when I attend the meetings 
but it's been a defining uh, affiliation throughout my adult life. I would agree entirely. I um, joined a little earlier than you did, <laughs> but I uh, and I served on the council for several years as well. And I never met a big ego the whole time I was there. I mean, even the people that had an opportunity to become a sort of a pushy person. Um, my, my gold standard is Scott Halstead. Scott Halstead, and I know you know him because he does a lot of work on, on dengue. Uh, he's a graduate of Columbia University. His mm -hmm. wife is a nurse graduate from Columbia University. Mm -hmm. So we, we got to be friends just because of that. And... He, he worked for the Rockefeller Foundation for many, many, many years and was the most humble, the most caring, the most altruistic. Uh, and there's somebody sitting right here, right now, that's the same way, and that's Daniel Griffin. He's the, you are the same as Scott Holstead personified. Your attitude is always with the people first. It's always you second, the creature comforts be damned. Um, you're all my heroes, basically. So I, I really am quite um, privileged to be a member of that group, having never gotten an MD, uh, <laughs> never seen a... Well, I did get to see parasitic disease cases while I was at Columbia as a technician, but uh, it was a, a joy, an absolute joy, and it still is. You know, I dropped out for a while, but I, you, you brought me back. You you asked me to give a talk at your food symposium. Oh I yes, was, of course. That was the. Uh, I was very happy to do that. Organized that reconnected it. us. You know. Yeah, that was fun. Oh, that was and, great fun. And 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 it should be said that uh, probably yes. uh, more than fifty percent of the members are PhDs or rising. That's right. You know. That's right. Uh, scientists. It's certainly not exclusive to uh, exactly. MDs, and there are people who work basic science, there's, you know, clinical trials science, there are right, people right. who work policy, very senior people in global health policy. It's a very good way to cross-fertilize ideas sure. um, at the meetings. It's a wonderful menu of, of uh, intellectual content. That's right. That's right. And you get to meet a lot of people from other countries at yeah. the meeting. Like about half of the people at the meeting are for somewhere else. Oh, yeah. So uh, out of the country. And, and that's quite amazing. You get their stories firsthand. Yes. And that's hard Claire, to beat. Claire, can you tell us how you got interested in uh, science communication? Well, yes. Um, I was kind of the star English student as a kid. I wasn't the star <laughs> science student, but I, I, I fell in love with medicine and uh, that happened when I was in high school biology. So I was a pre-med as I mentioned. Uh, and for many years, because of the training, uh, I didn't think too much about writing, but I, uh, I was writing the occasional, well, I wrote papers, of course, as a fellow, and um, but that was technical. <laughs> um, I did spend three months in Taiwan in the early 80s when I was still a fellow, which will connect to the discussion around rat lungworm disease, because I saw cases there in the 80s. But, um, and I remember writing a very interesting full-bodied article about my time in Taiwan for a, a magazine. But I would say the real turning point in my life uh, was when I left my first job as the chief and Indian of infectious diseases at LA County Olive View Medical Center. Olive View, by the way, is at the top of the San Fernando Valley. It was originally the first TB sanitarium for, the, for LA County. Um, and then it had several iterations. They rebuilt as a general hospital. The hospital fell down in a huge earthquake. They rebuilt. I was in that facility when it was kind of in a temporary hospital for 20 years. Uh, so I, I worked in that position, as I said, for about three years. And at that point, I felt I was meant to move to another stage of my career, but I could not figure it out. And I am very willing to share this story because I think it's useful. I left all of you with extreme ambivalence and I was very beloved, to be perfectly frank. 
my chairman would not accept my resignation and make it formal until the last day. It was, it was, it was really <laughs> kind of tore me apart. But I knew I needed to kind of stand back. And I think it's because I do have this creative side and I hadn't really figured out how to combine the things that I might be best at in my life. Um, I had been successful, by the way, as a basic science researcher, but it wasn't my passion. And I don't think it would have, I, I don't think I was extremely talented in that way. I think I was capable and I worked with excellent people. So I was prolific, but not because of me. Um, so I took a year off. I did several overseas stints, but I answered an ad in the New England Journal of Medicine. At that time, cable television was really just getting its feet wet the largest cable network was uh, owned by ABC, Hearst, and Viacom. And it was Lifetime. Lifetime television, which you now think of as television for women or a certain kind of brand, had all day Sunday devoted to health and medical programs. And oh, wow. the reason this was appealing to the business people was that it was the first time the FCC had allowed pharmaceutical companies to advertise on the public airwaves. So Lifetime Medical Television was based in Los Angeles. The rest of Lifetime was in New York. They had about 50 people working in a kind of fancy, swanky building, which didn't at all resemble my office at all of you. Um, and they were advertising for a medical editor. Uh, and a medical editor in that context was more like just somebody who knew some medicine and could help with fact checking. But the quality of the programs was quite good, partly because they thought their programs were going to reach medical professionals and people in healthcare. It turned out, so they had the money to attract talent, uh, talented producers, editors, directors. My husband was in that very talented group and I met him the first day that I started working there. Uh, but the shows were vetted by experts and panels at NIH, and yet the audience was 90% lay people. And this may have some resonance for you. There was an appetite, there was a hunger for this kind of quality vetted medical information, and it covered everything. So I started working there, and I ended up, this is around the time I was debating my return to UCLA. And by the time I was signing the paperwork to return to UCLA as their travel and tropical medicine, infectious diseases, whatever, I knew that I would never be 100% time at UCLA. And I said, I will take the job if I can be 60%. And they found a way to make that happen. And that is really what enabled me to, to I worked in television for about six years. I wrote, I'm a member of the Screenwriters Guild. I was on camera as a reporter. I was a co-anchor for the flagship show, which was a weekly kind of news and interview show on Lifetime. The only reason they took Lifetime Medical off the air was that at the end of the day, it was schizophrenic for their brand to have two different kinds of content, um, all day Sunday, health and medicine. So I have not really seen anything quite like it since then. Um, mm. Nonetheless, I, I just had a tremendous education. And at that time, you know, I was back at UCLA. I was doing this gig in addition to doing clinical work, et cetera. But I was eventually approached to uh, write a, a, a column for the Los Angeles Times. The Los Angeles Times had a health set. A long time ago, Los Angeles Times was about four times as big as it is today. It had wonderful editors. I, I wrote a monthly column called The Doctor Files. I started writing Medical Mysteries for Discover Magazine, which was a very popular science magazine, and I've continued to do that. And I would do some television-related work from time to time. So it got mixed up, but I, I would define myself today more as a print journalist, except for the fact that I've recently produced this documentary, which uh, you know about. But I, uh, yeah, I mean, it just opened my it opened my eyes. I was working with professional journalists. Uh, some of the writers at Lifetime Medical Television were very, very outstanding print and broadcast writers. <clears throat> it was a, like a new world for me. I mean, I didn't know anything about TV, <laughs> but I learned. And it was great. Just one of the best things that ever happened. Well, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I met my husband and, you know, we're very happy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
so so you, you met your husband at the at the onset of the I did. His but, name and, is Patrick. And I met him on St. Patrick's Day in nineteen eighty seven. Oh, that's classic. <laughs> Isn't that good? And, and did yeah. you and he had been working in television, is that correct? Yes, he had he had already won many awards, but he had been attracted uh-huh. to Lifetime. As I said, they they brought in some very outstanding people to make these shows. And um, yeah, I mean, he had been working in television since his early 20s. And I met him, he was in his early to yeah, early 40s, I think. I was in my mid 30s. So, yeah. And, and you, you did another... You did another kind of documentary on hepatitis, right? Before the yes. lungworm. Yes, we did collaborate um, on a, one of my dear friends at UCLA who was a pediatric infectious diseases uh, physician but had also trained in virology at Yale, uh, was a hepatitis expert and mm-hmm. basic science researcher. And he eventually went into pharma. And he found this, actually, he was responsible for the approval of the first drug that was used to treat hepatitis B, lamivudine. Um, So my husband and I have collaborated on some special projects. For instance, my husband and I did work in Africa uh, uh, around some malaria policy work that I was involved with at the Institute of Medicine. We did a, a short film. But the hepatitis B show was funded by then Glaxo Welcome, you know, it had been Burroughs Welcome, then it became Glaxo Welcome, then it became GlaxoSmithKline, but at the time I think it was Glaxo Welcome. And that, they were very interested to raise awareness of hepatitis B, especially in countries in Asia where it was so prevalent. And many, many people would never know that they were hepatitis B carriers because they were infected, you know, through maternal child transmission, or they would be infected at other points in their life. So uh, Patrick and I and our cinematographer friend, Jim O'Keefe, this this required a tremendous amount of pre-production. I mean, we didn't just go off to Asia with cameras, but we did end up creating what I think is a very good, uh, engaging piece uh, that was filmed in, it, it includes stories from the U.S., but it was in, China, Thailand, Korea, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. And this included patient stories, expert interviews, a lot of local color, you know, acknowledgement even of traditional medicine. If you had guessed who was sponsoring the show, you would have guessed that it was a manufacturer of hepatitis B vaccine. You would not have guessed that it was, it was really meant to raise awareness of the disease Mm -hmm at a critical point for the populations. And we did not have the copyright, the pharmaceutical company had the copyright, but they arranged for this program to be translated into multiple languages. And as far as we know, it was just aired very widely. Now, can I attest to that myself? No, but that in fact was the goal. And I believe it was used. I still show it to classes at UCLA there are some very moving moments. And actually, I think it's now on Vimeo. I think I made it available recently. So it's, it's oh, nice. actually available for people to use. I would love it if people used it. It's, it's not that dated, except that it makes reference to some drugs that would not be used today, like interferon for hepatitis B carriers. Yep. Oh, we will put a link. We will put a link to it sure. in our show notes so That'd people can find it. Yeah. Claire, did you get to meet Baruch Blumberg while you were making your documentary? <laughs> no, I mean, that would have been wonderful. Of course, he's a giant in the field. Um, we weren't focused so much on the key scientific, you know, uh, discoveries as just humanizing the disease so that it could be, I mean, it really, you could say that a, a junior high kid could watch this be entirely engaged. One of the key, you know, tenets of making a good documentary for the public is that they never lose interest and, um, and shed a tear because there is one of the stories that is quite sad, several, but one in particular. Um, so no, we didn't get to meet him. Darn. But Nat Brown, who was our, the person who made it possible, of course, has interacted with all of those individuals. 
you you mentioned Tom Monath. We're he's going to be on TWIV in a couple of weeks. Oh, great! We've always wanted to have him on, and he was very happy. Oh, well, he's he said, great. I don't think all your listeners are going to be so interested in what I have to say, but I think that's where he's wrong about that. <laughs> I is absolutely wrong. Oh, Tom is very lively. Yeah. Yes, he is. Um, so tell us about Accidental Host, Claire, how that got started okay. and what's it about? Well, Accidental Host, the story of rat lungworm disease is needless to say about a disease called rat lungworm disease. <laughs> and it was not something that I planned on, but, uh, Two or three, well, maybe five years ago, my husband and I started a foundation. Um, we have a production company because of some of these special projects. But um, so the production company is HealthQuest Media Inc. Our foundation is called the HealthQuest Foundation. And the good thing about creating a foundation is that after you create it, then you start to think about what are we going to do with this? And uh, it, we've sponsored, you know, we, we sponsored a, a symposium at ASTMNH where um, the Preston brothers, including Richard Preston, came and talked about the hot zone. His brother, Douglas Preston, is also a great writer. You know, we've done a variety of things and it's sponsored CME, symposia, et cetera. But I, I've had a special interest in rat lungworm disease. I saw it and it is a, for the audience uh, a foodborne parasite, which is, we think, native to southern China. At least that's where it was first described in rats. Um, then moved to Taiwan in the 40s. Hawaii. Spread throughout the Pacific, is quite entrenched in Hawaii and does represent a risk to travelers, most of whom have no idea that it's there, <laughs> but has now globalized to five continents. So... I have friends in Hawaii who are on the governor's task force for rat lungworm disease. Um, I follow it. And it just occurred to me that our foundation could do something of value by creating a video that might be educational for doctors. That was the first concept. I have to say that it just took on a life of its own. And uh, we shot in Hawaii and we we found patients through my friends in Hawaii. We, we got patient stories. We have two excellent scientific advisors, Larry Ash, who I know Dixon knows is a senior parasitologist at UCLA, the author of a, a parasitology atlas that's been uh, now in its sixth edition used all over the world. And Larry is a good friend, and he did seminal studies on rat lungworm disease in Hawaii and French Polynesia in the 1960s. So he's in our film. So ultimately, it just took on a life of its own. We had a fantastic team. As the producer, you know, I just kept finding people that we knew would be great to work with. The same cinematographer that we worked with on Hepatitis B, who has worked with my husband over the years. Um, a wonderful editor, my co-writer, who's worked in television and worked with my husband over many years. Uh, our animator is from Boston, and he did some spectacular animation, also additional editing. He has worked for Nova for 20 years. This is what I find so gratifying as a producer. Um, I'm, I'm not one who often seeks like the top executive job. I never wanted to be a department or division chief or whatever. But when you have the right people and you have the vision and people enjoy working together, and this much of this occurred over the pandemic. Thankfully, we shot it primarily just before the pandemic. But then we had to work remotely. It wasn't all that easy. Normally, you'd be together a lot more. Uh, that That's really the story of how it came to be. So it is now a, you might say an hour length. It's like 53 minutes. We have a distribution uh, agreement that the lawyers just need to green light, but we're very close. So we are assuming that this will become um, the distribution. The first distribution agreement is for public television stations throughout the domestic network. So that's about 350. And uh, I certainly think it will be of interest in not just Hawaii. By the way, rat lungworm disease is in the continental United States. 
Right. And it's also in Europe now because it's been found in um, in uh, hedgehogs, <laughs> North African hedgehogs on Mallorca. Really? So it's, it's it's stones throw from Spain. So it's it is a globalizing under the radar uh, invasive yeah, species yeah, yeah. that is carried by other invasive species. Rats are invasive species. Right. Mollusks right. like the semi slug, which is a very important intermediate host in Hawaii is a recent arrival in Hawaii in the last say 25 years. So it's got all sure. of these layers. It's just an ecological yep. as yep. well as yep. a biological yep. medical story. Paul Beaver used to teach this um, to his students at Tulane. And I, um, having been born in New Orleans, <laughs> yes. I, you know, I merely jumped out of my chair when I learned that this thing was endemic. It's not just uh, passing through. It's It's been there a long time. And uh, I wonder what effects Katrina has had on it. So, but, you know, the thought occurred to me, Claire, you could rock this whole thing out as long as you could insinuate vertical farms that raise microgreens next to where oh. people consume a lot of them. No snails, no, no, no red lung, but, uh, you know, that's not going to happen either. <laughs> Well, r vertical farms have always appealed to me because they mitigate against foodborne parasites. Um, yeah, I, exactly. I saw exactly that connection. Right. <laughs> that was yep. five years ago when you came to speak at ASTMNH. But, you know, yes. uh, puppies get, I mean, animals get rat lungworm disease. In Hawaii, oh, sure. we, we have a vet in our film, lovely native Polynesian who went to vet school in uh, the Pacific Northwest. And uh, we actually do have a dog who was, has recovered from rat lungworm disease. Um, one wow. of our advisors on the film, uh, wonderful veterinarian in, in Australia, it, rat lungworm disease is present in Australia. So Richard Malik um, is a great science communicator and an expert. So sometimes it's um, cases in humans uh, when, the, when the parasite is at its worst, uh, it invades the brain within three to four weeks of ingestion of an intermediate host, usually a snail or slug. It can be a tiny, tiny snail or slug that can have thousands of larvae. Um, so at any rate, uh, I, I think I lost track of what I was trying to say. Um, sometimes it's the dogs yeah, that draw attention to the disease. Sometimes it's the humans. And there's a lot of unanswered questions about the extent of the disease in various tropical locales, but it can now be accurately stated that it is in five or six continents. So it moved from the Asia Pacific region to the Southern United States. It's well entrenched in the Caribbean. It's well entrenched in tropical parts of South America. And I have to tell you one story. I hope I'm just not babbling on, but there was an outbreak of this disease in medical students from my alma mater, Northwestern, who went to Jamaica on spring break really? in the year 2000. And the 12 that ate from the same shared Caesar salad all developed wow. neuroangiostrongyliasis. And we have two wow. of the recovered uh, students in our film, and we also have the ER doctor who made the diagnosis on the index case when they did the spinal My tap goodness. and they found eosinophils and yeah 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 that was in the New Claire, England they made any Clara have they made any progress in determining why the the parasite goes to the lung of a rat but it goes to the brain of a man, of a human what's it, the what's the break point it actually does migrate through the brain of the rat. That yeah, but it doesn't stay there, right? It doesn't no, stay it, there. it passes through. You're right, because it completes its life cycle in the rat. And it moves exactly. on to the pulmonary arteries and the adult male and female right. mate. But humans the just get the brain form. Yeah, this is what Larry Ash just cannot get over at his age of 88. He marvels. He's very <laughs> passionate about this particular parasite. He knows all parasites, but he loves rat lungworm because... It was Australian women parasitologists who first discovered that the worm, the subadult worm in the rat had to, it's a mandatory migration through the brain Interesting. before it gets to its final destination uh, ah. as an adult in the pulmonary uh, vasculature. It's just I'll a fascinating done. parasite. In, in humans, it, it gets to the, the subadults, the 
L5 stage, get to the spinal cord and brain, and they die. And then people can have a variety of severe neurologic consequences. Wow. Yeah. Do you treat so, with any drugs or do you just let them oh, gosh, go their natural course? course? No, 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 no. I mean, the, the, the goal is uh, to diagnose it early, which is a challenge because we don't have a very good blood test. So the, the general wisdom is that you wait for people that have neurologic symptoms and do a spinal tap and look for eosinophils and do a PCR. Right, it's not wait. a good idea. It's not good to wait. Um, there is right. a new ultra-sensitive PCR that's been developed in Tom Nutman's lab at NIH. He's the head oh, of the yes. parasitic yes, disease. Yes. So a recent patient um, who uh, I know quite well who's in Seattle who picked this up when she was on vacation on the Big Island in December – it took six weeks for her to get to an ID doctor who suspected rat lungworm disease. Then they did the spinal tap and sent the fluid to Tom's lab. And he and Will Sears, who's a terrific postdoc ID fellow, ran the test. It was strongly positive on her spinal fluid, but it was also positive in her blood. So there's hope for, I mean, this is one of the messages in our film is, you know, early detection, because yes, you want to treat with an anti-helminthic in the early stages. It, the, the Ivermectin? Large, they grow a hundredfold from the time you ingest them to the time they get into the uh, hmm. central nervous system. So by that time so, when they die, there's a lot of negative consequences for the host. What is, what is your treatment of choice? Essential. Steroids are essential to decrease the inflammation. Sorry to step sure. on you. But yeah. Yep. Treatment. Yes. yes. Treatment. So. I'm going to the Big Island in October. What do I need to do to avoid this? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stick with the meat. <laughs> I would say do not have a green smoothie. There is no kill ah. step. By the way, another person in the film is Steve Ostroff, <clears throat> who was the deputy director uh, at FDA and also a, a great I, – he's not trained in ID, but he was at CDC. He's very knowledgeable about foodborne infections. So as he would say, there's no kill step. So, you know, a, a green smoothie with kale could easily have something that was clinging to this rough, leafy green, like a baby infected semi-slug mm. or another kind of snail. Many snails and slugs can carry this. Um, I would be, you know, it's a debate whether you want to eat fresh salads. Some people in Hawaii actually get their salad greens from California, but there are lo many local farmers markets and mm -hmm. there's a desire to have local produce. And of course, everybody is supposed to be eating produce because we want to have a healthier diet. But I would certainly be very wary of anything that was uh, like a salad. If you were in okay. a five star hotel, fine. Anywhere by the side of the road, meh, I would be uh, probably dubious. And uh, there's very little information posted to alert travelers to this disease. And the Big Island is, is probably the most heavily affected. It is throughout the islands. It's, you know, it's on Maui, it's on Oahu, but the Big Island and particularly the windward side, but you could go to Kona, you could go to other parts mm -hmm. of, of Hawaii and it would be present. And they've done surveys of, snails and slugs and found it 75 percent of semi-slugs in the puna district which is on this windward eastern side what does that say about the rat population the rats are there to stay they're not going anywhere and they're heavily infected. no but you've got a lot of rats then right well if one it lives in hawaii one should do everything possible to try to keep rats away from the <laughs> immediate domicile and same is true for snails and slugs but they, as I, I mean these are facts of biology they exist they're not going to be right removed so claire i have one more question for you and that is uh you know i i'm i'm a science communicator and i always want to be better at what i do so what's your advice what's the best way to communicate science to a lay public who is not scientists you know, I, I don't fancy myself as an expert because I, I, what I would say is you've done something fantastic. You have met a need and you're doing something that is true to yourself and authentic. 
Uh, for those who wish to write, the craft of writing is a lifelong journey. So that's another category of expertise. My uh, personal take on television, and I did it, um, it's a lot of effort, actually, to be on television, and it's not something I particularly crave at this time of my life. Uh, you know, there are some excellent people who are covering science on television, but I feel that we are somehow missing... Uh, I don't know quite what to say. I, I think doing things that are creative and original and different, this is the time. Let me hark back to what I mentioned. I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question because I feel nervous about just giving generic advice. Um, <laughs> the National Academies of Science is starting a, an ongoing program in science communications. When I was a consultant, and I was a consultant for the Institute of Medicine and worked on some large reports as a writer, they were always interested in dissemination, but they didn't exactly know how to do it. It's very hard to, to bridge that gap. Um, but what I noticed about this year's uh, announcement for the Science Awards is that it couldn't have been a larger tent. I believe they were trying to get an understanding of what is actually being done, some of which may not be appreciated or might be, you know, niche. They were, um, I mean, I have to be honest, we did submit our, our <laughs> documentary. I'm not holding my breath. But um, they were clearly interested in anything from a podcast to a TED Talk to a uh, written piece of science journalism. They, they had categories for people who are researchers. They had categories for people who are more, you know, lay journalists they were trying to, I think, understand the breadth of science communications and then think about what could, could be better. I personally would like to see more outreach to schools by, uh, you know, mm -hmm. scientists and physicians to have a kind of a partnership with schools. I, I like the, um, I had attended a meeting once of the National Science Teaching Association uh, and their national meeting had 50,000 science teachers from the U.S. I was blown away. These are very smart people. And I, I felt, I've felt i always felt like ASTM and H should somehow get connected with them. But it may not fit the mission. Anyway, that's a personal interest of mine. I want our film to be available to those science teachers. Mm -hmm. okay. So there's lots of ways. There's lots of things to do. Many people can do whatever is right for them. But craft comes into it. I mean, if you're going to make a documentary, you've got to have people who have real skills. If you're going to write for a That's magazine right. or a newspaper, you have to have a certain amount of skill. But it is something you can pursue and learn. It's just a question of, you know, what's your priority? What you're doing, hey, you know, you've, you've already demonstrated that it's very uh, valued. Yeah, we... I mean, our goal is to reach more people and, and also younger people than we yeah. usually reach. I think it's very important. So there are ways that we're trying to do that. Um, it's just a matter of getting help. I can't do everything myself any longer. It's beyond that. <laughs> right. So <laughs> well, you've got a great team. I'm sure each person here has, I feel, as I said, a little uncomfortable about having talked so much, but um, it, it, clearly is something that I'm looking at Christina, I'm looking at Daniel, I'm looking at this. You've all done this in different ways, but maybe you have a special pet idea if you wanted to add one more thing to your plate. That's that's the big question, time. I go into schools plate. and be a very large Sorry. plate. <laughs> go ahead, Christina. Yeah, I, I go into schools, um, secondary schools, and I've also been to primary schools, and it's really, really good fun. Um, children love parasites, so it's yeah. very, very rewarding. Claire, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Oh, I, it's been a total joy. And I, I'm, I'm gra grateful that, for the opportunity. Thank you for having me. I've been looking up lungworm in Scotland, and there's quite a lot of lungworm here, but not of the sonotic kind. 
So oh, really quite interesting. And and the species is um I think it's ang anglios ang ang I can't say it ang angiostrongulus masorum, I think, or more commonly Ooh. known as the French French uh, <laughs> lungworm. So I thought it was quite interesting, but it's not sonotic, but it's very common in dogs apparently. There's been twenty three cases on the lungworm map around wow. Glasgow. Yeah, we did. We've had it. You've had a yeah. lungworm case, I, we I did believe, have a right? Long trip, yeah. yeah, we yeah. we talked about one on one of the earlier twips. It was a case of a of a younger um, woman at Columbia. I think we maybe even had one of the fellows involved come on and do the presentation. And we did. Um, I do remember yeah. that. Yeah, and we talked about treatment and everything else. And um, uh, you know, I was thinking Claire and I have a lot of overlaps because um, we in the management we reached out to a buddy of mine, Johnny Cates, who's on that rat rat lungworm task force in Hawaii, um, just sort of helping us with guidance um, of the management. Um, but yeah, and then remember we got scolded because we were uh, there were a couple gentlemen who were imbibing some uh, alcoholic beverage out of some bowl, and then at the bottom of the bowl was a slug, and then they ended up getting the you know oh, yes. angiostrongulus, and and we chuckled, and apparently that was insensitive of us, so we had to apologize. Right, <laughs> I remember. I remember. I'm chuckling again. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm, that's right. Not that's insensitive. right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's get to our case from last time. Daniel, can you remind us what this is? Yes. So for everyone tuning back in and those uh, tuning in for the first time, uh, the case from the last twip was of a 42-year-old uh, Spanish-speaking male, originally from the capital city of Honduras, um, and he had been admitted to the hospital after having a seizure. Um, he had grown up in Honduras. Um, and then had come, you know, here about 20 years previously. So he has a 20-year history of seizures. Um, he's now living in the New York City area. I think I mentioned last time, originally he came, lived in Texas for a while, now he's moved up here. Um, he's been on seizure medicine with a medicine, uh, carbamazepine, which has been prescribed to take twice a day. Um, when we got to chatting and also verified with the pharmacy, he had not picked up that prescription for um, at least three months. Um, so when when I see him initially, this is after him having a seizure, um, his heart rate's a little bit rapid, um, oxygen sats are fine, um, his uh, temperature is, is fine, he's not running a fever. We went through a bit of a review, no surgery, no toxic habits, um, nothing that exciting in the uh, history except for this history of treated seizures. Um, his physical exam was unremarkable. Uh, he underwent some blood work. Um, and he also had a CAT scan. He had some some imaging of his head that we discussed because, you know, of course, um, his complete blood count was normal with a normal differential. Um, he had a slight elevation in the blood in the blood glucose. Um, and there are a couple things that we talked about. Um, the initially he had a uh, CT scan of his brain, and that showed this area of calcification. Um, and I don't know if I gave much beyond that. We had some questions about his diet, things like that. All right. We have quite a few guesses. I do. Dixon, could you take that first I one, please? I would, I would love to. Evan writes, good evening. The weather here in Farmington, in Farmington Hills, Michigan, after a beautiful Memorial Day weekend, is a pleasant 78 degrees. The gentleman in this case is suffering from chronic calcific neurocysticercosis from the larval cysticercus tinea solium, or the pork tapeworm. TB would, however, remain in my differential diagnosis. Tinea solium is typically acquired by eating undercooked or raw pork infected with the cysticercii tinea solium. They migrate to the brain, hmm, and develop into mature cysts two to three months. These eventually degenerate and leave granulomatous host inflammatory cells and parasite remnants. This inflammation <clears throat> may cause seizures, but in this case with a 20-year history of seizures, it is most likely from local vasculitis and thrombosis. Perilesional edema may be present on MRI around the seizure episodes, EEG may show changes, 
but not necessarily. <clears throat> Serology tests are inconsistent, but enzyme-linked immunoelectrotransfer blot assays of serum or CSF have shown significant specificity and sensitivity. As this patient likely no longer lives in tinea solium, or no longer has live tinea solium after 20 years, um, cystocidal drugs are unlikely to be beneficial. Treatment should consist of ongoing seizure prophylaxis. Sincerely, Evan. So we should probably like not let this go. <laughs> um, right. You know, a lot of this email is good stuff, um, but there's a, I, there's a couple issues here that I think we're going to get into. So we're going to yes, challenge we the idea that um, neurosister sarcosis is acquired from eating undercooked pork. Yes, we don't. Does that seem fair? Is this crowd on board? <laughs> That's very yeah. fair. Yep. Very fair. Yep, for sure. So we're going to be talking about, um, you know, because should this be neurosister sarcosis, we want to make sure people understand, understand yeah. how it is Got acquired. It. So, the um, uh, it, When I taught this in medical school, I actually made the students recite after me, and it was as follows, uh, eat the egg, get the adult – Eat the larva, eat the adult, and get the, the larva. So you you eat the egg, and you get a, a tapeworm. And if you eat the tapeworm, you get cystocercosis with all the eggs migrating in every direction possible. Does that make any sense? Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but they, the they, they, they gladly the, recited it, and yeah. then almost no one got that wrong on the test. And <laughs> yeah, by the end of this, hopefully, we'll drill in the, uh, the tenia solium life cycle. Exactly. Daniel, can you can you take the next one, Daniel? Karen writes. First off, I have to confess, I giggled with Doctor when Doctor Griffin said "do do," which I interpreted it as the noun "do do." And there's a little picture of a pile of brown stuff. Um, I think the patient has ingested pork tapeworm eggs. He or a food preparer probably ate undercork, undercooked pork containing tapeworms at one point. The worm then produced eggs, and those <laughs> eggs followed a fecal oral route of ingestion. The larvae then insisted in the brain, causing seizures. Twip it, twip it good. Karen in Santa Barbara, California. Let me go back and, re <laughs> and re re recite what I was saying before. <laughs> I, I said, eat the egg, get the larva, eat the larva, get the adult. That's the way I said it, and I just uh, misspoke just before. So eat the egg, get the larva. Eat the larva, get the adult. Now, do any of you know what Twip It, Twip It Good is a we reference do, to? We do, we do, we do. I think there was a song back in my youth, which was you quite right. popular. You can twip it. It was, it was called <laughs> Whip It, Whip It Good, and it was by Devo. It was <laughs> yes. And they wore weird hats, right? They had these weird hats they yeah, would wear. They wore weird hats. Shocked yeah. the monkey. They were shocking the monkey. Christina, can but, you take the next one? I can. Sean writes, Hi all, long-time listener, first-time caller. Here is my guest for a 42-year-old patient with a history of seizures. I believe he's suffering from neurocysticercosis due to the calcified lesion in his parietal lobe. He likely acquired his infection 20, 20 some, some 20 years ago when he began having seizures by ingesting the eggs of T. solium. MRI and the rest of the patient would likely reveal many more extraneural lesions throughout the patient's body. It is surprising that none of his previous doctors ever thought to have a brain imaging done to investigate the cause of his seizures, as my guess is this would have led to a much earlier diagnosis for him. Treatment with albendazole and possible surgical removal of the brain lesion. Thank you all for the work you do in educating us all about the wide world of parasite. About the wide world of parasites. As a biology undergrad, I thoroughly enjoy procrastinating, working on my assignments by listening to Twip and Twiff. Regards, Sean from Vancouver. <laughs> Alexander writes, dear professors, the patient here is su not suffering from an ongoing parasitic infection. The single calcified lesion is probable evidence of a prior infection with the larvae of T. solium, also referred to as cystocercosis. Calcification indicates that the larva is dead 
and MRI did not show any additional lesions. Therefore, there's no indication for antiparasitic treatment at the moment. Looking for eggs in the stool might be worth considering as he could also be infected with an adult T. solium causing tinnitus, which would make him infectious to others. His real problem is his structural epilepsy, which is most likely caused by the calcified lesion and his stopping his anti-epileptic medication. What this patient needs, in my opinion, is a thorough investigation into his reasons for that. Did he have trouble remembering to take his dose? Did he experience side effects? Does he have barriers to acquiring his medications? Did he simply think he might not need it anymore? Most of these issues could be solved in one way or another, and the goal should be to get him on anti-epileptic therapy, as this seems to have worked very well in the past. Alternatively, referral for evaluation of anti-epileptic surgery could be considered. Lastly, since Vincent asked about raw or undercooked pork, cystocercosis is acquired from foods contaminated with the stool of an infected animal, human or otherwise. Eating undercooked pork can cause tinnitus, which doesn't cause epilepsy. Well, the best, Alexander from Vienna, Austria. I agree. All right, Dixon. Wayne writes, dear Twip, Oops, I sent my guess in too late to be read out on the last episode. Serves me right for putting it off. That's ensured that I send this one in plenty of time. I'm thrilled to hear about it. I won a book. Thanks very much for your generosity. My guess this week is that this gentleman has neurocystocercosis, but I don't know how common a single brain lesion is as opposed to multiple. I suppose it varies with the intensity of infection, but the mention of the whole body scan makes me think he has cystocerci every elsewhere, so I'll stick with that. I also have a special request. I recently visited a close friend who has a new 11-week-old baby and coincidentally found out that his father listens to Twip and Twiv. So I was wondering if you could give a shout-out to Dermot Walsh and his adorable granddaughter, Olive, if you need justification. An uncharitable soul might say new babies are pretty parasitic on their parents' sleep. Well, <clears throat> I just love giving shout-outs for that reason, so that's a shout-out, and uh, good on you. Mm -hmm. Daniel. Alice writes, Dear Twip, it's currently 12 degrees and thunderstormy here in Cambridge. Thanks for another interesting case. I believe the patient is suffering from neurosister sarcosis caused by tinea solium pork tapeworm. The nonspecific coarse calcification described is likely calcified cystocerci larva, but the CDC recommends confirmation using an immunoblot assay if available. If active infections, albendazole is the recommended course of treatment with a corticosteroid such as dexamethasone prescribed at the same time to reduce the symptoms caused by the inflammatory response resulting from larval death. However, it is unlikely this patient has active infection, so anti-helminthic therapy is not recommended. Instead, he should resume taking carbamazepine to manage his seizures and other drugs to manage symptoms as and when they develop. Best wishes, Alice. Christina. Sarah writes, Dear doctors, Racaniello de Pommier, Griffin and Naula. Hello from a sunny and windy 22 C day in Montreal. I had never heard of podoconiosis before the last episode. So interesting. A 42-year-old immune-competent patient with a solitary epilo epileptogenic intracerebral calcification present for more than 20 years produces a very broad differential. Luckily, we can narrow the differential based on the fact that this patient consumes food. And we've got a winky <laughs> emoji there. Generally, a solitary intraparenchymal calcification in a patient with two decades of seizures would prompt me to produce a list of possible metabolic, endocrine, ischemic, neoplastic, toxic and infectious causes. I'd leave out the congenital causes like tuberous sclerosis and Sturge-Weber syndrome, etc. because of the adult onset of his epilepsy. However, this case would not make it on the show if it weren't caused by a parasite still. Here's my narrowed list. Neurocysticercosis, much more likely than any of the following. Cerebral toxoplasmosis, likely the serological testing Dr. Griffin referred mm. to. Remote ischemic cerebrovascular event, 
septic embolic event from bloodstream infection, neurosarcoidosis. Likely diagnosis. My guess is that this patient has neurocystic sarcosis secondary to tenia solium, acquired via fecal oral route from ingestic tenia solium eggs from someone with teniasis. Mechanism of infection. A beloved attending once pimped me with the question, can a lifelong <laughs> vegetarian develop cysticercosis? The answer is yes. You must consume meat to develop teniasis, but no meat consumption is required to develop cysticercosis. This is why I suspect Dr. Despomier asks, do, these, do his family members eat pork? People develop adult taper infection, teniasis, by eating raw or undercooked meat containing cysticerci that then develop into adult worms within the intestines. Those adult worms lay eggs which are released with the stool. When that same person or another person consumes the eggs, those can hatch and migrate out of the intestinal walls as larvae and climb along vascular or nerve tracts to form cysts throughout the body, often muscle and brain. Tenia solium eggs can be eaten on a salad, fruit, cilantro, etc. Treatment. This patient's lesion is calcified, the worm is dead, and no one mentioned a fluid-filled cyst or a ring-enhancing cyst with a central scolex, which would indicate a viable cyst that would require treatment with praziquantel. Unless this patient has concurrent caniasis or has viable cysts elsewhere, including in the muscles, heart and eyes, the treatment for him is anti-epileptic medications to prevent seizures. I would test members of his household for teniasis to prevent reinfection for him or auto-infection for them. The body scan Dr. De Pommier asked about that elicited a vague response from Dr. Griffin would reveal any other cyst for this patient. I'd want to do a careful eye exam. Thank you again for the incredible educational material. I'm two weeks away from starting my intern year and I'm trying to learn all that I can. Twip, twiff, an infectious disease podcast. Make learning mm -hmm. so fun. Gratefully, Sarah. Daniel writes, Daniel, you can't answer your own. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a Canadian Daniel. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Hello again, TWIP team. It's 16 degrees C outside. We've had just about everything today. Sun, clouds, wind, a little rain. Weather keeps you guessing this time of year. Now it's time to take a guess at what ails this man who is originally from Central America. Symptoms seem to match closely with neurocysticercosis caused by the pork tapeworm, tinea solium. People who are infected with the adult pork tapeworm excrete the eggs in their feces in unhygienic conditions. People can ingest these eggs uh, from food contaminated water, unwashed vegetables. Because our digestive system is similar to pigs, the eggs hatch, the larvae invade many tissues, including the brain, and then they wait, but they can't wait forever. Eventually they die and form calcified cysts. T. spiralis and toxocaracanus cati can also cause neurological issues if their larvae migrate through the brain. However, trichinella prefers striated muscle where it modifies the sarcomere to its liking. And I think someone would have to be aware that they are eating a bunch of uncooked meat before one wound up in the brain. An infection with toxocara would be associated with inflammation, redness, ocular larva migraines, or visceral larva migraines, and they only stay alive for a six to eight months. Cheers, everyone. Daniel from BC and Canada. Right. Dixon. The Parasitology Club of the University of Central Lancashire writes, Dear TWIP professors, greetings from Parasitology Club at University of Central Lancashire, located in the beautiful northwest of England. Exams are done, the summer is coming, and we are planning for our summer school and the imminent arrival of PD7 books. Colleagues at our veterinary school have promised samples teeming with interesting parasites and sometime, and something exotic from a nearby zoo. So we are looking forward to all that. Our considered opinion is that the condition is neurocysticercosis caused by the larval, caused by the tapeworm, Tadia solium. Tadia solium is a zoonotic parasite that infects both humans and pigs, and when ingested, it can spread from the small intestine to the central nervous system and any other organs connected to it, including the brain. It can be transmitted to humans by eating raw or undercooked pork that contains the cystocerci of T. solium. 
which attach to the epithelium of the small intestine and develop into adult worms. Ingestion of tinea ova, or gravid proglottids, from fecally contaminated material or a household contact with the tapeworm results in the hatching of the oncospheres, which can then spread from the intestines to the central nervous system via the bloodstream. Neurocystosicosis is diagnosed primarily by MRI or CT scans of the brain. Serologic testing for patients with central nervous system symptoms uh, gives a reference. With criteria including the presence of cysts in the subretina, presence of the scolex of a parasite in a cyst, lesions that are uh, greater than 20, cent- 20 millimeters in diameter, and the movement of lesions or subsequent scans if more than one is carried out. The recommended treatment for neurocystosarcosis is the administration of anti-inflammatory drugs such as corticosteroids and um, with the elementic drugs in addition to corticosteroids and AEDs for cases with viable cysts. Certain cases may require surgical intervention. Thank you for providing us with another challenging case Benjamin, on behalf of the Parasitology Club of Central Lancashire. I'm really, actually really, really attached. exciting to possibly meet the club because... Um, I agree. They, yeah, they, yeah. We should have them one as a Skype or something. So um, I, I have been emailing um, together. I have been emailing, emailing... Well, David has emailed me... Um, who is running this club and um, we how, made the range of How far meetings. away from so, you are they? Uh, I don't know. Um, not maybe two or three hours drive. Um, I, right. was, I was thinking maybe by Zoom. So we'll see. So very exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Long yeah, reference yeah. list as well. Always good. Indeed. Very <laughs> thorough. Daniel. All right. Martha writes, greetings, keeping it brief since I'm typing on the phone. Regarding the 40th man with the 20 plus year history of seizures and imaging showing calcified brain. I'm guessing cystosarcosis from ingesting embryonated tinea solium eggs as a young person. Serological testing could support this diagnosis since the parasite is dead and calcified, he would not benefit from anti-helminthic agents. A neurosurgeon could give an opinion regarding removal and if anti-seizure meds will be needed after removal. Best wishes to you all, Martha. Christina. Kimono writes, and I am really sorry if I'm not pronouncing that name correctly. I hope I've, I've done my best. I tried. Dear TWIP team, firstly, Dr. Daniel, I am so thankful that this 40 t two-year-old Honduran gentleman with a seizure disorder presented to your hospital. We rarely do further workups in a person with a pre-existing seizure disorder and the likely explanation for the breakthrough event, medication non-compliance. My leading diagnosis is T. solium as the evil parasite that neurocystis causes as the cause of his seizures. My thoughts also went to T. gondii and a few other neuroinsavive neuroinvasive parasites, but the specific seizure history and solitary lesion made T. solium more likely. I hope I got it right, but my simple mind is still grappling with with why these seizures continue indefinitely. Would they not abate once the inflammation and the edema have subsided a while after calcification of the parasite? Or is the mere presence of a calcified lesion in the CNS that is the culprit? Since his seizure started over 20 years ago, I would presume that this lesion calcified about that time and present imaging is now not showing any ring enhancement. Many thanks for providing such captivating topics through stimulating conversation. Kimona, um, it's actually Kimona, so I did get that wrong. Now in Vermont, where today is a bit overcast and the crisp 18 degrees Celsius. A.L. writes, dear heralds of knowledge and common sense. No, sorry, this is for Daniel. Daniel, that's yours. <laughs> okay. Oops. Let me, this is Is that right? Is it Dan- no, I think it is you, Vincent. Oh, okay, I do sorry. Too. If right, we're doing it by timing, it's all you. <laughs> <laughs> it's your turn. Dear, dear heralds of knowledge and common sense, good day from <laughs> Sydney, where all has settled into a nice and mild Australian winter. Maybe As you thought f- it was for me because he said, dear heralds of knowledge. Was that what it was? No. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> 
As to the 43-year-old gentleman who has stopped taking his anti-seizure medication and has now relapsed, not surprisingly, it looks like neurocysticercosis caused by larval cysts of the pork tapeworm, leading cause of adult epilepsy in cases of it growing in the U.S. Thank you for another opportunity to read about a new disease I have never luckily encountered before. Dixon, back to you. Chelsea writes, greetings from a sunny and comfortable 79-degree morning in Bat Cave, North Carolina. My guess for episode 207 is neurocysticercosis based on the calcified lesion and seizure activity alongside the unremarkable physical exam slash labs in the patient's upbringing in Honduras, where tinea solium is endemic. Neurocysticercosis treatment for this patient would not include any homeopathic drugs since the cyst is calcified. Treatment would focus on controlling seizures and management of any existing edema, intracranial hypertension, or hydrocephalus that may occur. On a side note, I learned about tinea solium for the first time in high school biology class my senior year in 2003. I've been a vegetarian <laughs> since that very day. <laughs> Yeah, well, now uh, we're finding out that might not keep you safe. <laughs> that's that's true. And he gives a shout out to his uh, his uh, his teacher, uh, Mrs. Uh, Beckerink, and then he signs it warmly rather than warmly. Chelsea, okay, that's clever, very and clever. Is it me? Is it? Do I go now? Andrew yeah. writes, Kia or from Pongaroa. Yeah. Weather today is the winter solstice. Need I say more? <laughs> <laughs> but we also. <laughs> are celebrating the Maori New Year, Matariki. So that will keep our spirits up on these gloomy days. Considering the city where our patient comes from has pork as one of its staple meats, I feel fairly confident in guessing he has neurocysticercosis caused by the migration of an infestation of a larval tinea solium via the bloodstream to the brain. Here the unfortunate creature has died and calcified to produce posthumously, the man's seizures. As the TikTok generation keeps telling us, keep hydrated and take your meds. This cause of the falling sickness, as it was known in ancient times, makes me wonder if this is what caused Julius Caesar's epilepsy as he developed it later in life, according to Plutarch. It is probably too late for an autopsy, but it is fun to speculate. Nah, Andrew. Christina. It's my turn, but Vincent, first I need to apologise because, because I've messed up your numbering in the letters. I thought it was being helpful, but I think I wasn't. <laughs> 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 you, you missed some out and I thought there must be people who have already won the book, so I'm, I'm sorry I messed that up. Um, That's right. No, Andrew won a book. Uh, just... Yep. Jennifer writes, Good afternoon, Clip hosts Vincent, Christina, Dixon and Daniel. I'm a middle school science teacher writing from my air-conditioned boudoir in Arlington, Virginia, on this sunny 85 degree Fahrenheit day. This is my first ever attempt to diagnose a case after listening for over two years. I am in love with Parasites Without Borders and would make a financial donation if I were able. But alas, my teacher's salary won't permit it. After hearing of the circumstances surrounding the gentleman from Honduras experiencing chronic seizure, it is my humble non-medical opinion that he's afflicted with neurocysticercosis caused by the larval cysts of tenia solium, aka the pork tapeworm. I do hope I've written this in time, but if not, I will try again. Kindly yours, Jennifer. Elise writes, Dear Twip Collective, I hope, how are you? I hope this finds you well. After a wave of excellent weather, we are now in the hot and murky phase of summer, which is very uncomfortable, but matches my mood in the wake of upsetting and enraging Supreme Court decisions. It is 75-ish degrees, 24C in lower Manhattan, and raining intermittently. I do have a diagnostic guess for 206. I believe the gentleman is suffering from neurocysticercosis. And I make this guess not just because I had some inside scoop, because I was sitting next to Vincent at the last recording. I did detective work <laughs> on my own. Patient has a history of epilepsy. And while there are many iterations of this syndrome, one of its causes, particularly in certain Latin American countries, Honduras, where the patient is from being one of them is a tapeworm, tania solium. Infection, in this infection, a host ingests the tapeworm eggs and the larvae find their ways to different parts of the body, including to the brain, where they can calcify and create a host of problems, including 
epilepsy, encephalitis, meningitis, and neurological problems such as cognitive or personality changes and vision problems. One detail I've found that was particularly interesting is the suggestion the helminth infection is more likely a candidate for this diagnosis than other parasites because these infections can produce a substantial immune response in the host where the autoantibodies that the host generates can actually induce epilepsy. I include this because it was really fascinating to me, but since I discovered it in a not at all recent National Library of Art Medicine article, it's possible that it has been disproved by now. What is to be done for the patient? Will he need surgery to address the calcifications and relieve his symptoms? Is the solution to have him return to his medication and take it more faithfully? As always, I am so grateful to you all for everything you do and for keeping me interested and engaged, especially at times when the world threatens to be overwhelming. Best wishes, Elise in Lower Manhattan. And that will do it for today's emails. Any other guesses? I guess uh, now we've got three three folks that get to, to come in with their guesses. So who wants to start? I would like to start because <laughs> when, when you presented this, well, I learned about neurocystocercosis from Dixon uh, during previous TWIPs before you joined Daniel and from his lectures and the epilepsy, uh, all of that just hit home. And I said, this is neurocystocercosis. And I actually, after the show, I told Elise, this is neurocystocercosis. <laughs> but I'm sure she did research on her own. <laughs> okay. Yeah, All well, right. Vincent and I are long associates, and obviously, uh, I did a lot of teaching in this subject. So, and I've and I've actually seen a lot of cases presented at Columbia's medical uh, facilities. So, um, it's hard to go wrong on your guess on, on this one. Uh, it's neurocystis okay. caused by a tenius oleum larva, or juvenile tapeworm, as they're now called. So that leads. And by the way. One, Susan, you just very quickly. Um, we did a, a, a twip on on neurocystisarcosis, and with as I said with Dixon, and I had previously listened to a podcast <laughs> by a woman whose name I've forgotten, who had acquired neurocystisarcosis, oh, and really? she was describing it. So I sent her that episode of Twip and she was oh, very nice. grateful to oh, hear nice. about the details oh, of her disease. Very yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah great. Okay, oh, I'm, nice. I'm sorry, Christina, go oh, ahead. That's okay. So that just leaves me with my guess and I think I concur <laughs> with all of you. This must be neurocysticercosis. And actually it's very uh, reminiscent of a case that I was discussing with my diploma in tropical medicine students in this past teaching year. Uh, it was also a patient, well, it was a, a patient from Peru, so uh, in the not too distant vicinity, I suppose, of Honduras. Um, so it was a very similar case that panned out very similarly. So that would be my guess. Yeah, I, I think more than a guess, right? Yeah, I think yeah. I no, gave yes, almost I was everything. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think I gave almost everything yeah. we needed, and it is—it's a challenge. Mm. Um, because, um, you know, in this case, we have a CT scan and we have an MRI. And you really, you need both of those. And those are not cheap, right? These are not point of care, you know, stick a Q-tip up your nose. These are expensive technology. And the reason you, you need both uh, is that the CAT scan is only going to pick up calcified dead lesions mm -hmm. or lesions in the process of dying, maybe completely dead, where your MRI is going to be the only way you're going to pick up these earlier lesions. Um, so it is a challenge because in a lot of these areas where this is endemic, um, that's high you know, resource access to be able to have those technologies which you need. Um, so in this case, um, you know, the combination of the CT and the MRI, there really are classic appearances. Um, so this was very classic on the appearance. But you do need to think about it, right? That's the first part. Someone comes in with seizures. He's in the 40s. He's been on a seizure medicine. He didn't take it for three months. It very easily could have been like, oh, you got to start taking those. And you could have never really understood what was going on. Um, but in this case, the CAT scan was able to show that there was a calcified lesion. The MRI showed no other lesions. And then becomes the other part of the story, which is, I think, really critical, is understanding the life cycle and understanding that he did not get this from eating raw pork, but he no. got this from some fecal contamination. And about 10% of folks with neurocystosarcosis have adult tapeworms 
in their yeah, intestines that's right. and that is right. may have auto-infected, but mm-hmm. certainly are a risk for other people. Mm-hmm. So that was one of the other important tests. We did check this gentleman. We did the fecal um, over in parasites. He was negative. Um, in a perfect world, right? You start testing everyone around to make sure that the you know they're they're not having this, and and that you know his friends, relatives, people preparing food aren't spreading this. Um, but then this becomes the other issue. So here's a gentleman. Um, he is working. I think we mentioned as a mechanic. Um, he doesn't have health insurance. Uh, he has limited resources himself. So are there any other tests that are required? Um, what should be sort of the next management? And so, you know, did we go ahead and do a full skeletal survey? Um, we didn't, though if we had done, you probably would have seen, you know, calcifications uh, throughout. Did we do a full physical exam and a, and a good ophthalmological exam? Yes, that makes sense. It is not really something that's in any way resource uh, limiting. Um, We did do a serology test, um, and some of it was to make sure there was nothing else negative for toxoplasmosis. Um, And then the big thing is the realization, understanding the life cycle, um, that this man, you know, you can't kill something that's dead. Right. So there's no role, and I think our people emailing in were really good. Mm -hmm. There's no role at this point for anti-helminthic, anti-parasitic therapy. There's, I'm going to say, not a role for... um, steroids at this stage, really the management is, um, is seizure medications and, uh, you know, discussing with him the impact of taking those on a regular basis. Um, and interesting enough, in many parts of the world um, where we have limited resources, this is a medicine we actually use. This is on the WHO list of huh. medications um, that we have access to. Um, and in many parts of the world, this is really the leading cause of seizures. All right. Thank you, Daniel. Indeed. Very interesting. Uh, Dixon, case. do you have a do you have a, a hero for us, Dixon? I do. It's a, it's our guest, and I, I'm surprised that I haven't uh, thought of her before. That uh, Clara Panosian is a lifelong member of the Parasite Club. Basically, she began by being fascinated by them, that never stopped, and uh, she's made numerous contributions at various levels. Not the least of which, as I mentioned during her visit, was that. She was elected the president of that society. That's not a trivial issue. So uh, she's my hero. I will I will definitely make her my hero this time. All right. And Daniel, do you have another case for us? I I do. This is a this is a fun case. All our cases are fun. Uh, sometimes <laughs> what makes a case fun is it has a we'll say a good outcome. Um, so I, I get the call. Uh, from a uh, clinician asking for consultation. And um, I'm going to tell the story and then we're going to sort of dig into it a little bit. So the call is, um, uh, hopefully you can talk to this provider. Uh, They're taking care of this woman in her 20s. Um, She had spent um, a period of time in Kenya about six months prior. And now the provider wants to speak to you because this woman um, vomited up a worm. Okay. So I'm going to, we're all, we're all going to kind of go through this together. I think this will be fun. So um, we'll start with- it sounds uh, like a ball. So it said vomits (laughs) up a worm. (laughs) So, uh, so what, what were the questions? Do we, do we want any more history? What, what sort of the, because we're going to go through this hopefully together. So what what else do we want to know? She vomited up a worm. How big is it? Exactly. So that was my first question. And the answer led me to want a little bit more history. So I was thinking that this was going to be several sonometers. This was going to be, you know, earthworm size. Yeah, yeah. And the response was it was less than a sonometer, maybe half a sonometer in size. Um, and we're going to end up sending this worm off to a lab uh, to be evaluated. I will say it was moving. So she vomited up, and now, and now I say I need to know a little more history because, yeah, she was in Kenya. Yeah, it was six months, but why don't you tell me a little bit more about what happened? Um, so we go back a little bit in time, and it turns out earlier that day, um, this woman in her 20s went out with some friends to a um, sort of a mom-and-pop small sushi place. And ah. she ate the sushi, and then um, a period of time passed, and she developed really horrible abdominal pain. Then she started vomiting. 
Um, and then she kept the feces. I'm, I'm always amazed that people keep the vomit, right? Like, I mean, when I vomit, it's like into the porcelain toilet, it's the gone. porcelain altar. It's, it's I am sight. horrified I that I had that experience and here, I just want to forget that it ever happened. But this <laughs> woman <laughs> kept that vomit, brought it to this provider, um, and we actually have, you know, the the parasite um, identification from the lab. So any other questions that people have? Nope. <laughs> Everyone's feeling good. You've told you know, us too much information HIV already, status, Vincent. No, we you know what it the is. answer already. Come on. <laughs> well, we don't know yet, right? We know. Well, it was we don't a, know uh, yet, but it's. Uh, if you guessed maybe anything our, else, maybe our listeners will know. Because let remember, me, they, uh, <laughs> let me ask you: Did pr prior to vomiting the worm, did she have any symptoms for the prior six months? Uh, no, she felt absolutely fine. Okay. Um, Yep. So, so Kenya's I think the red Dixon herring, feels basically. like he knows what's going on. Vincent the feels color? like he knows. Yeah. Christina? What is the color of the worm? That's a good question. What's the color? Uh, I'm not giving you that. I know what it is. I mean, I can like I know you it. do. I know you do. <laughs> okay. I think I know what the I'm color sorry. is as well. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> okay. So okay. that'll be our, for our listeners. What is it? Um, how did she get it? And what do we do at this point? Correct. And that's another... Twip, previous twip in one of your lectures, Dixon. That's why I know. <laughs> All right, that is say, good. And I have to say, don't I have a cool job? Isn't that, an, isn't that a great phone it's call? It's amazing. It's amazing. Just amazing. Great phone Just call. imagine your patient coming in with a bag of vomit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it's I would like to know the name of that restaurant also. <laughs> yes. Vincent, I think that we haven't done the book yet. Oh, yeah, the book giveaway. We got to give away a yes. book before we end. I'm trying to get out of here because I have something tonight. <laughs> yes. How many numbers did we have, uh, Christina? Before 11 I messed or it 12? up, um, I think 11. Yeah, Jennifer writes it's the 11, number 11. All right. So, so our, our, Elise was our 12. But we don't count her, Dixon. You didn't read trouble. Elise. No, she's no, got no, a because already. if you get a book, you don't get a book again. That's, well, we, you have we, another she one got a book. Too, All right, our number is nine. And number nine is our winner. I'm very sorry to, to do right. that. Who is number nine? Al. That's, no, Al already won a book. Yeah, I think that's okay. so, That's why I miss, so messed up your numbers. I'm sorry. To, so Chelsea is number nine. Yeah. Chelsea. From Bat Cave, North Carolina. Bat Cave, that's right. I love it. <laughs> what a great name. Chelsea, send your uh, address to twip at microbe.tv and I will get you a book autographed PD Parasitic Diseases ep, uh, edition number seven. And that is twip. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate your paying attention there. Well, I did, <laughs> I did mess it up, so I kind of remembered. That's twip207. Show notes at microbe.tv slash twip. Send us your questions, comments, guesses to twip at microbe.tv. And, and if you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe. Indeed. You know, now when you say thank you, I expect that automatically. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what podcast it is, it's funny. Dixon de Pommiers at trichinella.org, thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. It's a pleasure. It was a, it was a lot of fun. This is good stuff. Christina Naula is at the University of Glasgow. Thanks, Christina. Well, thank you. Um, I always enjoy joining, so great fun as usual. I'm Vincent Yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. I've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is, is parasitic. 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 parasitic.